You are listening to the second segment of our eight-part series, Bountiful Beans, with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Time Monk Radio. Hi, Jim and I. How has your week been? Wonderful. What about yours? Great. Did you eat any beans? You know, we are growing scarlet um, emperor beans this year, and Chinese red noodle beans are favorites. They're not quite ready. All right. Do you eat them green or do you wait until they get dried? Uh, we eat them fresh. Now, the Scarlet Emperors, we shell those and eat those. Um, so we wait for them to dry a bit. But the Chinese red noodle beans, we pull them straight off the plant and saute them. Uh, isn't it amazing that here's um, a food stuff that we can eat in so many different forms? Absolutely. That the, the pod, when it's young, is edible with the immature seeds inside, which is why they're called green beans. Green as in not ripe, right? Like a green tomato or a green horn, yes. right? And then the ripened beans, and then the pod dries out and splits open along those two seams that we talked about. And then inside are the mature seeds, which store really, really well, and um, then can also be cooked and feed us through the winter months. Yeah, we matter, really fact, enjoy them. <laughs> indeed. As a matter of fact, last year at our uh, CSA, there's a Pick Your Own Garden, and they grew massive amount of uh, green beans for us. And it's always hard when you're there because you think, okay, there's X number of people who have shares, so I will pick one X of everything that's here, Right. So you think, okay, you know, there's 100 people, I'll pick 100th of what's growing. Right? Or there's 50 people, I'll pick it 50th of what's growing. It varies from year to year. Because you don't want to pick more than your share. But I tend to go out to the pick your own garden long after most people have decided that there's nothing left. And I harvest lamb's quarter seed and I harvest amaranth seed. And last year I was able to harvest over five pounds of dried beans where people hadn't picked the green beans. Wow. And we just went right through the rows and just, you know, picked all of those dried beans. Yes, they were grown as green beans. Yes, they were a variety sold as green beans. But do they make great shelled beans? They certainly do. And then what do we do this spring? We planted them. Yes. So now we have the whole spiral, right? From the beans they planted to the green beans we ate to the dried beans they became to the dried beans that held us over the winter to the beans we planted in the spring. And we, I can just see the beautiful red flowers of your beans. In uh, some languages, beans are called after the same name as butterfly because of their flowers. Do your scarlet beans have especially beautiful flowers? Um, the ones that are most memorable to me are the Chinese red noodle beans, and the bees love them. And they have, so do the ants, oddly, but um, they have like a white flower on them, and it's kind of fragrant. Ooh, how nice. Mm. Bean flowers are, aren't generally known for their fragrance, <clears throat> although there's a nice smell to laying in a field of clover. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, I, when I went to, like, kind of check out the nutritional information the, about green beans versus dried beans, I was prepared to hear that green beans weren't as nutritious as dried beans. Somehow that kind of made sense to me. It's like, well, yeah, you know, we know that some of the really important things in the dried beans are that they're really rich in fiber and that they're really rich in B vitamins and they're really rich in certain minerals. And I was very pleasantly surprised to discover that the green beans are considered to be basically every bit as useful nutritionally and medicinally as the dried beans. So if you have a toot problem, and for some people the toot problem from beans is far worse than for others, 
then you can still eat your beans by eating green beans. Hooray! 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 Let's look at um, some of the primary properties of beans, and then we'll come back to green beans and see how they fit in with these. Item number one is protein, and we mentioned this last week. In our first talk about beans, we talked about how the whole family, the whole pea and bean family, the Fabaceae family, fixes nitrogen from the air into the soil, thus providing the fertilization that the plants need to grow and be strong in the same way that we need protein, the plants need nitrogen. So the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in nodules in their roots do that for the plants. And then the beans, because they have been fed all of this nitrogen, are able to make lavish amounts of protein for us. Now, I am personally of the opinion that the human organism thrives on a very high protein diet. I know there are other people who are worried that we might eat too much protein, but I have never been worried about that. And you know what? None of the world's people are worried about that. Every person on this planet craves and seeks out as much protein-rich foods as they can. Again, what's the complaint we have about the American diet? Not enough fruits and vegetables. Check. All right? Too much protein. Ah, but here is the, shall we say, the secret turn, the magic of it. We want to get that protein from sources that are not high in fat. When we get a lot of protein from sources that are very high in fat, then it is more difficult for us to remain healthy. When we get that protein from sources that are low in fat, they actually have a profoundly beneficial effect on how our bodies deal with all fats. And yeah, I bet you've already guessed, beans fill that bill. And, of course, I can't help but mention that nourishing herbal infusions fill that bill as well. It's one of the reasons that I push nourishing herbal infusions. They're very, very rich in protein, which I think everybody needs as much as they can possibly get. But they basically contain zero fat, so you get a tremendous protein hit with hardly any fat at all. Similarly with beans, certainly there is a little oil in beans, and so they are not 0% fat, but they are very low fat for the amount of protein that we get from beans. And most beans, a single one cup of cooked beans provides a third of the protein that we need on a daily basis. It's a large amount of protein. This makes all parts of us strong. Remember that muscles are built of protein. And especially as we have a more aging population and one of the great problems that comes with age is lack of muscle strength. As we age, muscles have a harder time getting a protein from the food that we eat. So the older we are, the more protein we need to eat to get it all the way into our muscles. And the more protein that we can get from plant sources like nourishing herbal infusions and like the great many varieties of beans that we have to choose from, the healthier, stronger, and more independent we will be throughout our lives due to the wonderful things that happen with protein. Now, some people say, well, wasn't there a study that showed that people who ate meat lost bone? And I heard this, in fact, from so many places. Oh, we shouldn't eat a lot of protein. We especially shouldn't eat a lot of meat because... Um, 
it, it causes you to actually lose minerals. So I went back to see if I could find this study. But thank you, Internet makes everything that's ever happened instantly or somewhat instantly available to us. At least we feel like it is. And I was actually able to find this study where they had compared um, people who were eating a high-protein diet to people who were eating a low-protein diet. And it wasn't a study of one kind of protein against another protein. They were giving all the people the same protein, but they were giving it to them in various amounts. And it was true that the people who were getting the higher amounts of protein were having more health problems and were having especially more um, osteoporosis and bone problems. But here is the kicker. The protein that was used in all of the group studied was soy protein isolate, which is hardly even to be considered food. And I am not at all surprised. And when we get into our, um, let's see, what is it? That's, it's going to be our fifth week together. Well, I will talk about soybeans. Are they healthy or is it just a bunch of hype? And we will see that it's no surprise at all that people eating large amounts of isolated soy protein would have health problems. Soybeans, perhaps of all the beans, are really the least healthy for us. It doesn't mean that they're unhealthy, but they are just not giving us the real goods that we need. Although they are indeed rich in protein, and they are also rich in fiber. Now, fiber is something that has been talked about a long time, and a variety of different things have been kind of given to say, oh, if you have a fiber-rich diet, you won't get colon cancer, and then we studied it, and well, it's not really true. I mean, it's kind of true, but it's not really, really true. So what is it with fiber anyhow? And I mean, different kinds of fiber that are indeed. And, of course, you can go into a drugstore, and you can buy a fiber supplement, or you can buy food in the supermarket that has fiber supplements in it. Instead, let's eat foods that already contain lots of fiber, like beans. Beans contain both soluble fiber and insoluble fibers. And they both have very interesting ways of interacting with our body and helping us. Soluble fiber absorbs water as it moves through the stomach and the intestine. And as it absorbs that water, it becomes like a gel. And that gel slows down metabolism. It doesn't slow down the rate at which you burn the food. It slows down the rate at which you turn that food into sugar. So a whole host of things happen. First of all, you feel full longer. When you eat beans, when you eat soluble fiber, you have a sensation from this gel-like action of it literally being full. The slower rate of digestion of the carbohydrates in beans, and yes, beans are high in carbohydrate, and that makes some people say, well, beans are not good food because they are so rich in carbohydrates. Ah, but this is complex carbohydrates, and those complex carbohydrates are generally metabolized more slowly than the found carbohydrates. But when they come along with soluble fibers, that slows it down even further and makes it very much a slow time release. The insoluble fiber repels water. So rather than swelling up, it goes through the intestines and moves all the way to the large intestines and it is more active in the large intestine. So the soluble fiber works more in the small intestine, helps to slow down the rate at which our food is turned into sugar, thus decreasing diabetes and a host of other things. And the insoluble fiber gets all the way to the large intestine 
where it then helps to sweep things through the large intestine, increasing the bulk of the stool, which thus prevents constipation, and can also help prevent irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis, and a whole host of other bowel problems. The fiber in beans has been shown to have dramatic benefits on people with type 2 diabetes. When people eat a standard American diabetic diet, which contains 24 grams of fiber a day, as compared to a group eating a diet containing 50 grams of fiber a day, we found that the high fiber group had almost halved their levels of blood sugar when they were very high and had very much improved their cell's ability to utilize insulin. The high fiber group also reduced their total cholesterol by nearly 7%, their triglycerides by 10%, and their very low density lipoprotein levels by 12 to 15%. Yes, indeed, beans are healthy for the heart. Studies that look at food intake patterns and risk of death from coronary heart disease consistently find that the one thing that relates the most to heart disease was is legumes. In one very interesting study, researchers followed 16,000 middle-aged men living in the United States, Finland, the Netherlands, Italy, what used to be Yugoslavia, Greece, and Japan for 25 years. Got that? For 25 years, 16,000 middle-aged men at the beginning of the study, they were pretty old men, by the end of the study, throughout the world, basically, U.S., Finland, Netherlands, Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece, and Japan were followed. The people ate pretty typically of where they lived in Northern Europe. Um, there were more dairy products were consumed in the United States, more meat was consumed in Southern Europe, more fish and wine was consumed, and in Japan, more soy and more fish. But when the researchers looked at all of the data in relationship to the risk of death from heart disease, the only thing they found that really held up was consumptions of legumes and daily consumption of something in the bean family was associated with an 82% reduction in the risk of heart attack. Recent study in the Archives of Internal Medicine confirms that high fiber foods prevent heart disease. 10,000 American adults were followed for 19 years. The people who ate the most fiber per, per day, and we're only talking 20 grams and over, had 12% less coronary heart disease, 11% less cardiovascular disease, a 9% drop in cholesterol, when beans replaced bread and potatoes in their diet, and a 19% drop in cholesterol when a cup of cooked beans was eaten on a daily basis. Now, if you're thinking, oh my goodness, I don't know if I could eat a cup of beans again, hark back to our first show. Peas are beans. Green beans are beans. Lima beans are beans. Lentils are beans. Chickpeas are beans. Eating hummus counts as eating beans. There are many, many ways to get beans into our lives and into our diets. And as we spend our couple of months together here in the great, uh, bountiful bean area, we are going to be looking at at how to get more beans in our diet. Now, did you, did you notice that very interesting idea that the beans were used to replace bread and potatoes? What would that look like if instead of two pieces of toast with your fried eggs, 
there was half a cup of cooked beans. Hmm. Very typical of breakfast south of the border. Right? Part of the problem with that toast is not the toast itself, although if it's not from good whole grain bread, well, that is part of the problem. But part of the problem with that toast is you've been conditioned to want butter on it. And part of the problem with that toast is you've been conditioned to want jam or jelly on top of that toast. Whereas you're probably not going to put butter or jam or jelly on that half cup of beans. So you might try seeing where you could replace potatoes or bread with beans in your diet. Green beans, as I have said, offer the same nutritional and medicinal benefits as other beans. They are low in fat, and they are an excellent source of protein, fiber, and complex carbohydrates. Green beans are also a very good source of folic acid. Now, this is not exactly true. What is found in plants, including green beans, is folate. And folate is converted into folic acid in the, the body. But because most people are used to reading on the ingredients label that folic acid has been added, I like to say it first. That way you feel a little more comfortable and um, at ease with the idea that you don't need to get folic acid from supplements. You don't need to get flour that has been enriched with folic acid. You can eat beans, you can get the folates, and it's very easy to make your own folic acid from that. Green beans, like dry beans, also provide significant amounts of many minerals, including iron, magnesium, manganese, potassium, and phosphorus. Hmm. Now, B vitamins, as we have mentioned, are also well sourced in dried beans and in green beans as well. Any kind of bean is going to be an excellent source of B vitamins with a couple of things to keep in mind. And that is that while B vitamins are not harmed by normal cooking temperatures, in other words, even if you cook your, back, your baked beans for 24 hours in the oven, you're not going to harm the B vitamins. You can't cook them out through long cooking. Even if you soak your dried beans and toss that water, you're not going to toss out the B vitamins. They're still there in the beans. And even if you cook those beans for three or four hours, the B vitamins will still be there as long as you're cooking them at temperatures no higher than boiling. If, however, you bring your beans to a temperature higher than boiling, that high temperature does start to break down the B vitamins. Now, if you're kind of rubbing your head and saying, well, how could you possibly cook at a temperature over boiling? I mean, once it's boiling, it's boiling. And then how do you get it hotter? Well, how do you get it hotter? How would you get it hotter? Yes, you're right, a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker would cook at temperatures over boiling. And unfortunately, this is one of the places that people use their pressure cooker, if they have one, is to cook beans. Don't! Turn your pressure cooker into a planter. Drill some holes in it and plant flowers in it. Because the things that people normally cook in a pressure cooker, meat, beans, and grains, are rich in B vitamins, and cooking at temperatures over boiling breaks down those B vitamins. So find other ways to cook your grains, your beans, and your meat. Maybe slow down a little bit and don't feel like you need it that fast. Or if you really feel like you need beans that fast, choose lentils instead because lentils cook up really fast. And we'll talk about that when we are talking about lentils. The folic acid and the B6 in all beans helps to lower levels of homocysteine. Homocysteine is an amino acid. It's a protein. And it's an intermediate product in an important metabolic process called the methylation cycle. So we are supposed to create homocysteine, and then homocysteine is supposed to be used up by the methylation cycle. If we are not methylating enough, then the homocysteine doesn't get used up, and we get elevated blood levels of it. Elevated blood levels of homocysteine are a risk factor for heart attack, stroke, and vascular disease. You don't have to have any 
other risk factors. Just having high levels of homocysteine indicates that you are at high risk for heart attack and stroke. And if we turn around and look at people who have had a stroke or heart attack, about 40% of them have high levels of homocysteine. So we're not saying that we could use it as a screening, that we would find everybody who's going to have a heart attack, but we certainly are saying that high homocysteine levels are a problem. So let me go back to the beginning of this discussion, folic acid and B6 lower levels of homocysteine. So if you are not disposing of that well, then eating beans will definitely help you. There are antioxidants in beans as well. And I am sure that it will come as no surprise to you that the beans that are the most colorful are the beans that have the most antioxidants. So green beans certainly are an excellent source of antioxidants, and they have more antioxidants than, say, white beans would or canela beans would. But once we start looking at things like black beans or Anasazi beans or Aduki beans, we start to get higher and higher levels of antioxidants. This is certainly true when we're looking at fruit. And most of us by now know that the darker colored fruit has far more antioxidant power to it than the lighter colored fruits, that blueberries outshine grapes, for instance. As a matter of fact, we tend to think of blueberry as our kind of native hero, you know, who needs acai berries, who needs goji berries, who needs all of these strange and foreign berries. We have blueberries, the all-American berry, that is considered one of the highest of all foodstuffs in antioxidants. Well, red kidney beans have more antioxidants than blueberries. And remember that these antioxidants found in the coloring matter in plant are heat resistant. As a matter of fact, you get more of them and more benefit from them once your foods have been cooked. So think blueberry pie rather than blueberries in your yogurt or freeze those blueberries and then um, blend them up into your yogurt that way. Green beans and shelled beans are the two primary ways that we eat beans. Now, I promised you I would talk a little bit about Anasazi beans and lima beans, but oh my goodness, I've used up all my time. So let me just give you a little information here. And I'm going to, uh, about lima beans, and I'm going to talk about Anasazi beans in another one of these programs because they're quite fascinating. Uh, lima beans are very rich in molybdenum. As a matter of fact, a cup of cooked lima beans contains 300% of the molybdenum that you need. And molybdenum helps you to get rid of sulfites. There are people who are very sensitive to sulfites, and we find that these people are low in molybdenum. So if you are, eat more lima beans. And lima beans are such a favorite bean. You can even buy frozen cooked lima beans, just put them in your soups and so on. That's another caveat there. Those B vitamins, they don't. They, they're not very sturdy. It, once the uh, beans are frozen for more than three months, those B vitamins start to degrade. So make sure you use up your frozen lima beans. And lima beans, like all beans, are um, quite rich in manganese, which is important for energy production and to disarm free radicals. Lima beans are just one of the many beans that we are allying with here in the next couple of months. So come and visit me at susanweed.com or come and visit the wisewomanbookshop.com where you'll find lots of information about um, my online courses, my correspondence courses, my books, and so much more. And of course, don't forget to tune in right here to Time Monk Radio next week where I'll be back talking to you about peas and peas porridge. Green blessings. Thank you, Gemini. Thank you, Susan. This completes the second segment of our eight-part series, Bountiful Beans with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio.